Hey, what is going on my dudes? I'm back with you guys with another video. Uh, please consider subscribing to the channel if you're new. A lot of my viewers aren't subscribed, which is totally fine, but just like, do it, you know? Um, sorry this took so long to get out, but I think you guys are gonna love it. Um, my video on Zuko Psychology has risen to my most viewed video, which I'm so happy about. But on that note, I want to continue with the train of thought on a show that hasn't quite gotten as much love and attention, but I think it deserves it. And that show is, of course, based on the title of this video, going to be She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. You have never been anything more than a nuisance to me. I've kept you around this long because Adora was fond of you. But if you ever do anything to jeopardize her future, I will dispose of you myself. When watching the show, there were many times when I thought I was getting bored of what I was watching. However, something kept drawing me in. Inside the rough exterior, there was art buried deep within. she and the Princesses of Power is a show with many faults. But one thing it managed to get right is the writer's deep dedication to developing its villains. Something I found striking when I watched the show was that I could only find one villain who was not seen crying in the whole series. While this might seem insignificant, it shows that the writers built characters with enough emotion and depth that they could bring themselves to cry. Their motives were made clear, and the show is remarkably unafraid to challenge the ideas of what makes someone evil. In no character were these questions asked better than in Catra. From the start to the end of the show, Catra remains a morally gray character. The reason that I kept coming back to the show, I think, was because I was so invested in Catra's determination and her psychology. The first thing we are going to be looking at is her upbringing. Catra grew up in the Fright Zone and was being trained to be a soldier. While her parents were both unknown, that doesn't mean she didn't have a parental figure. Throughout her childhood, Shadow Weaver worked as her mother. Despite her claiming to love Catra and Adora, Shadow Weaver's initial actions show otherwise. The first thing that we're going to be looking about in Catra's psychology is her abuse. Motivated as you completed the course in that time, I'll never know. Always serving up those pep talks, huh, Shadow Weaver? Silence! Do not be flippant with me! Shadow Weaver tends to emotionally manipulate her quote unquote children in a way that could be seen as emotionally abusive. The first category of emotional abuse is humiliation and criticizing. One aspect of this is name calling. Name calling is when the abuser blatantly and repeatedly calls their victim harsh words such as stupid or loser. Or things that are much harsher that I'm just not going to say here. Um, the first scene in which we see Shadow Weaver and Catra. Shadow Weaver calls Catra lazy, despite her having accomplished the challenge that she set out for her. This trend continues throughout the show as Shadow Weaver continually insults Catra in an attempt to get her to be more obedient. Catra has been nothing but a disappointment to me. Another example of humiliation and criticizing is belittling people's accomplishments. This comes in both the form of saying that their victim's accomplishments don't mean anything and taking credit for their victim's accomplishments. Shadow Weaver gives many examples of both these things. Shadow Weaver says Catra should focus more on pleasing her and tells her that she is a disappointment. Perhaps the worst example of Shadow Weaver telling Catra that she means nothing is when she says she only keeps her around because Adora is fond of her. My command force, Captain. Therefore, anything you manage to do right is credited to me. Shadow Weaver also claims that their accomplishments came from her. She repeatedly tells Adora that she would be nothing without her in an effort to get her to come back to the Horde. Shadow Weaver also takes credit for the accomplishments Catra makes, saying that because Catra is in her division, Shadow Weaver deserves the credit. But perhaps the worst example of this is the way she excuses her treatment of Catra. She tells Catra she raised her the way she did in an effort to make her strong, that all of the put-downs were so that Catra had to struggle and fight her way to the top, and that she would never have been able to do it if Shadow Weaver had raised her differently. I said go! The second category of emotional abuse is control and shame. These signs of emotional abuse tend to have to do with making someone feel ashamed for their inadequacies. An example of this, and perhaps Shadow Weaver's abusive choice, is direct orders. Example of this behavior are phrases such as, Get out of your room now! While in some regards, it is appropriate for her to boss Catra around, both as her commander and as a parental unit, but the orders are often given in a way that are meant to be responded with unwavering obedience. Another example of this is monitoring your whereabouts. Although Shadow Weaver never uses her spies on Catra, 
The way she uses her shadow spy to track down Adora is further evidence of her abusive tendencies towards the both of them. The third category of emotional abuse is blaming and denial. Shadow Weaver frequently uses guilt in an effort to control Katra. She tells Katra about how much she has suffered in an effort to make Katra be the best soldier she can be. In an effort to mano emotionally manipulate her, she tells her about how much she sees herself in Katra. You want impertinent as always, I see. With such a grand failure under your belt, it would benefit you to show more respect, cadet. I gave you a simple... The final way in which Shadow Weaver emotionally abuses Katra is through the way she demands respect. This is done in a way to make Katra become more dependent on Shadow Weaver. She often tells Katra that she will respect her, and that the only approval that Katra need worry herself with is Shadow Weaver's. But this respect is a one-way street, and Shadow Weaver no never shows Katra any respect throughout the whole show, except maybe before she died. But why does all this matter? How does her emotional abuse affect the way she acts throughout the show? People who suffer from abuse tend to have similar reactions. One of the most common reactions is a change of behavior which causes aggression, anger, and hostility, something Katra clearly displays in her treatment towards Adora. Her abuse also explains the reason for Katra being so harsh on Lonnie, Kyle, and Rogelio. Children who suffer from abuse are far more likely to become abusive parents, and the same reflection happens when Katra becomes force cabin. Despite hating Shadow Weaver for the way she treated her, she goes on to continue the cycle of abuse and damage others in the same way. It also explains why she secretly, s desperately seeks approval from people like Hordak. Being emotionally abused causes children to have lower self-esteem. In Catra's attempt to cope, she seeks out validation and approval from people in power, but even admits it doesn't make her happy, which correlates to the last reason it matters, which that it can lead to other disorders to take shape, such as depression and attachment disorder. Look out for me, and I look out for you. Nothing really bad can happen as long as we have each other. You promise? The first disorder we are going to diagnose Katra with is RAD, or Reactive Attachment Disorder. Reactive Attachment Disorder is when a child doesn't develop healthy attachments with caregivers and develops when a child isn't given the love and care they need. Reactive Attachment Disorder is typically pretty rare, but Katra falls perfectly in the type of person who would be most likely to suffer from something like this. For starters, Catra is an orphan, and while she only had one primary foster parent, orphans are still more likely to suffer from disorders such as this one. You could also describe her upbringing as being closer to institutionalized care, as she grew up without really a family other than the Horde, uh, which raised her likelihood to developing RAD. She also was abused as a child, another likely factor in developing this disease. You didn't mean to hit Lonnie. The first symptom Catra shows in her extreme clingingness to Adora. Since Catra couldn't find affection in caregivers, she attempts to get it through Adora to the point where their relationship is almost toxic. When Adora wants to hang out with other people, Catra gets extremely jealous and clingy, even to the point where she hurts Adora. That is not what a normal, healthy person would do in this situation. Though her clinginess is excessive and the symptom of her attachment disorder, at least with Adora, Catra had someone to go to for comfort. However, after Adora abandons her, her symptoms start to worsen. You're a bad friend. Catra's disorder shows its true phase in her relationship with Scorpia. After Adora leaves, Scorpia tries to fill the void in Catra's life and be her friend. But due to her lack of skill in forming attachments, Catra pushes Scorpia away, despite Scorpia trying desperately to be there for her. This is an example of Catra's second symptom of R.I.D., uh, failing to ask support and assistance, slash not seeking comfort or responding when comfort is given. Despite her clear need for comfort in her distress, she refuses to receive any and chooses to take on all of her emotions by herself. The third symptom that Catra displays is unexpected withdrawal and irritability. When Lonnie asks Katra to go do something fun, she is excited and for once finally feels happy, but then out of the blue, her mood suddenly shifts. She becomes angry and withdraws herself from the event. Her unexplained changes in behavior stem from her inability to form a bond with other people, and when she is reminded of that by them hurting the drawing, she turns away from them. Though her interactions with Lonnie, you can see that Katra watches other social interactions but refuses to take part, another sign of R.A.D. While she watches people like Lonnie and Scorpio enjoy life and smile, she sits and thinks about what can be done about the war. 
In order to live a healthy lifestyle, people need to take a break from emotionally stressful situations and form a bond with other people, something that unfortunately Katra struggles with. Katra, why are you doing this? This isn't a game because you left me. Though not typically in the way you expect, Catra also suffers from PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a, when a triggering event occurs and people have a difficult time coping and readjusting to normal life. Most people will suffer from something similar in their lifetime, but when the difficulties persist for months or years afterwards is when a diagnosis might be needed. While most people think of PTSD stemming from either violence or death, I'm going to make the argument that Adora's abandonment was a significant cause for Catra to suffer from PTSD. As mentioned before, Catra was unable to make emotional attachments with her parental unit, so she used Adora as a surrogate. To Catra, Adora was the only person who loved and cared for her. The loss of Adora would be the equivalent, or greater, than the loss of a family member. And in the earlier seasons, Adora was basically her sister. So when Adora leaves, the betrayal could be extremely traumatic to Katra. To Katra, the abandonment might feel very similar to what a child might feel after being abandoned by their parents. Whether or not you choose to accept the event as sufficiently traumatic, through her symptoms it is clear that Katra views it as such. The first symptom she shows is recurring unwanted, distressful memories of the event. Though many of them are triggered by magic, Catra's narration over them shows that Catra has spent a lot of time thinking about Adora leaving her, despite it clearly being something that brings her pain. She also shows signs of avoidance. When Lonnie touches a drawing of, of Catra and Adora together, Catra has an unprovoked emotional response that stems from her trauma. Despite her constantly thinking about it, she wants the reminders to go away, and when they finally do, we see her smiling and happy. However, the moment she's reminded again of her trauma, she goes back to her now normal state of angry and reclusive. When Scorpio also abandons her, it is impossible for her to avoid the memories any longer. The stress of her memories causes her to go insane, and she becomes paranoid about what people are saying and spends all of her time looking for her friend. This could also be a sign that she is always on guard, afraid of who might betray her next. For that reason, she is harsh and abusive to the only people she can kind of call friends, Lonnie, Kyle, and Rogelio, in an effort to make sure they stay and don't add any further trauma to what she's already suffered. She also clearly suffers from negative changes in thinking and mood. For example, this can include difficulty maintaining close relationships. After Adora leaves, Katra has basically no close relationships with anyone, and she doesn't attempt to form new ones. Rather, she simply suffers by herself because even the act of letting someone in could remind her of her trauma. She also shows a lack of interest in activities that she used to enjoy. Lonnie says to Katra that they used to be friends and asks her what happened. This shows that Katra used to take part in the activities she now steps away from. This is another sign of PTSD, as people who suffer it often stay away from activities that they used to enjoy. Lastly, her PTSD is important because it is often coupled with suicide and depression. Alone. You've lost. What are you waiting for? Do it. Looks like we're both alone. Sparkles. Perhaps the heaviest and most important topic we need to discuss is suicide and depression. Though Catra does not display all possible symptoms, such as lack of energy or changes in appetite, that people would associate with depression due to her need for validation, she expresses enough of them to warrant a diagnosis. Angry outbursts and frustration, even over small matters, is something Catra does frequently throughout the show to her friends Lonnie and Scorpia. People who are depressed are also more likely to show signs of being suicidal. An example of her suicidal behavior is the amount of risk she takes. Suicidal people often risk their own lives. Katra can often be seen wherever the action is and confronts Adora on several occasions. Despite Adora being the strongest creature on the planet and plenty capable of killing Katra, Katra goes and risks her life, often without a clear purpose. She also goes on to risk her life even more when she opens the portal that ends up killing Glimmer's mom. Despite Entrapta's warnings of the danger, Catra continues with her plan, believing the cause was worth risking her life and everyone else's. She also withdraws from social contact and often wants to be left alone. Despite people continually trying to enter into her life, Catra prefers to be left alone. Stemming from the pain she felt after Adora left, she completely shuts herself out from the rest of the world. She pushes other people away who try to be close to her. She sits and ponders to herself. They didn't believe in you. They didn't trust you. Didn't need you. Left you. But did you ever stop to think? 
maybe they're not the problem. Despite her trying to hide it, she also feels hopeless, empty, and worthless. Though she uses her failures as a driving force, when she reaches the top of the horde, she realizes that her whole life had been meaningless, and that the world meant nothing. It's at this point in Catra's life where she hits an all-time low after being betrayed yet again. At this point, she finally asks Glimmer to essentially pull the trigger and end her. But luckily, Catra's story doesn't end sadly, and it is one that can lift people up. Despite all of her struggles, by the end of the show, Catra is on the path to recovery. After reuniting with her best friend, Catra is able to form a bond with people around her, such as Bo and Glimmer. Before the end of the series, she is able to reconcile with her abuser and finally start to move on from the trauma that she caused her. Though Catra still has a long way to go before she can move on from both her past actions and past trauma, she is taking the challenge as she does so many others, and I believe she will succeed. Thanks so much for watching this video. Please like and subscribe, hit the bell notifications, and click on either of the boxes for more videos like this one. See y'all later. I made it Disney, Disney, Disney.